Hello, kiddies. I'm Alice Cooper on Mulachuk. It's the only TV you need. And you better be listening, because I know where you live. Rolling Stone magazine called you uh, the world's most beloved heavy metal entertainer. I mean, you started out shocking people and yeah. scaring people. Yeah. Now it seems like everybody, at least Iggy. in the rock biz, loves you. Yeah. Yeah. Iggy and myself and Lou Reed have all become lovable. <laughs> uh, I think we're not, you know, not as dangerous as we were before because when we first started out, there was no CNN, there was no internet, there was no, everything was urban legend. And so the things you heard about us, and most of them were true, you know, were pretty insane. I mean, Iggy and I, you know, in Detroit, we did a lot of insane things. Uh, and so, yeah, we were probably a threat to the public at the time. Uh, now I think we finally got, we were, we were the ones that lived. Most of our friends died, you know, trying to, trying to be rock stars. And uh, I think we, now we have a different view of it, of how to do it. You entertain the audience. You don't have to die doing it. Now, I die every night on stage, but it's a, you know, it's, it, that's part of the show. But I mean, you know, back in those days, I mean, Jim Morrison was a good friend of mine. Jimi Hendrix was a good friend of mine. You know, Janis Joplin, Harry Nielsen, Keith Moon. These guys, I drank with these guys every night. Bonham. But every, all of them. Yeah. And, you know, I watched every one of them just go down. And the, and the reason was, was they tried to be their character off stage. You, you can't take that character off stage and try to be, you know, Keith never knew how to turn off the, the switch, you know. So in order for him to be Keith all the time, he had to be taking something. Jim Morrison had to be taking pills and drinking just, just to maintain his Jim Morrison-ness. I found out a while back that the, the only way I could survive was to play Alice Cooper, was to become him at night on stage and then leave him there so that I could have my own life over here. And then at night, I really look forward to playing him. Tonight, I can't wait to play Alice. It'll be great. But I'm only going to be Alice for two hours. And then I can leave him there. I can go back and then lead a normal life. These guys couldn't do that. They did, they, it's, you know, hope I die before I get old was pretty much what happened, you know. Well, it, it still happens in, in rock industry, not as often as, as back Winehouse. in the days. Yeah. Amy, Amy was the perfect, you know, here's a girl that had all the talent in the world. And yet the drugs spoke much louder to her than anybody else. When you're a drug addict, especially if you're doing heroin, from what I understand, that's what the problem was. Heroin speaks so much louder than the family going, hey, quit doing that, you're going to kill yourself. You can't even hear that. Yeah. You know, all you're hearing is the heroin saying, come on, let's go have some more fun. They just But, bother you. you it, know? Come on. When I was an alcoholic, I mean, people were telling me, you got to quit drinking, you're going to die, you're going to die. And the bottle was going, what do they know? Yeah. You know, finally, I, when I quit drinking, then I got a clear view that they were right. But I mean, I, I couldn't hear them then, mm -hmm. you know. Speaking of that, but, but do you still get phone calls in the middle of the night saying, hey, got a problem? You know what? And if I do, I jump on it. You know, I mean, one thing that, that you learn as an alcoholic and, and as a, or as a drug addict is that let's say you have a problem. Let's just say you have a problem. I can't come to you as a friend and go, hey, look, man, you got to quit doing this. You got to quit doing it because your immediate thing is going to be. Yeah. I know what I'm doing. I'm not an. But if you come to me and you go, but Dave Mustaine mm -hmm. came to me and he goes, I got a problem. Mm -hmm. Then I go, okay, now we can work with it because you've already admitted that you've got a problem. Yeah. I don't have to convince you that you got a problem. Mm -hmm. You know you do. Mm -hmm. Let's get. Let's find a way to get rid of it. Yeah. And and then you can start working through it. But I can't go to them. They have to come to me. If Amy Winehouse would have come to me and said I have a real problem, I would have said okay. Yeah. Let's let's take care of it then, you know. And I would have told her what the process is, because you know that much about it. Well, I was there. I was there. I lived through it. You know, I had to go through the cure. I had to go through, uh, you know, 
Now, I had a different situation in the fact that I came out of the hospital and it was a miracle. It was just gone. My alcoholism was gone as if cancer was there one day and not there the next day. So mine was more, God took it away from me. You know, I mean, it was a miracle, absolute miracle. Um, 30 years, I never once have had a craving for alcohol. Now, that's a miracle. That's, that's crazy. But that doesn't happen very often. Most people, Aerosmith, are in AA every day. Oh, gee, yeah. But, you know, good. They're, they, they know what they're doing. They have to be there, so they do it. Uh, uh, I was, I well, was they messed more. up their career twice. You oh, know? Got, and they probably will two or three more times, you yeah. know. But that's Aerosmith. And they're good guys. They really are good guys. So I encourage them all the time, you know, guys, stay straight. Come on. You know? The original Alice Cooper band got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. Um, you have to go through that again in a couple years. Are <laughs> you looking forward to that process? You know, it was great that the original band was, I mean, it, when, when we got nominated, I was so happy it was the band because that band was the band that went through all the hell with me. We, you know, when we first started, it wasn't pat somebody patting me on the back saying, good job. Everybody was going, get out. We, you know, the only people that liked us was Frank Zappa. And The Doors were the only bands that put up with us. As soon as we left L.A., we found a home in Detroit because that was where I was from. Then the Iggy and the Stooges and the MC5 and, you know, all those bands, we were like one of them. We, we fit into that family of hard rock Detroit. So we were at home there. But we never got any encouragement from anybody. Everybody hated us at that point. That was the band that went through all that and still ended up making seven platinum albums in a row. So, you know, I mean, I was really happy. And they were my best friends. I went to high school with these guys before the band, before we even thought about being in a band. We were in high school together and best friends. So, I mean, to me, us being in the Hall of Fame was, like, really cool, really cool. But I'm sure it's going to be different when it's you alone then there. Well, you know, it's, it, I've had a career after the band, which went on, actually, we made 20 more albums, you know. Um, and, you know, if that happens, it happens. You know, I, I, I'm happy being in there with the band, really. You know, if that, I can think of a lot of people that belong in the Hall of Fame. You know, Moody Blues, Deep Purple, uh, Rush, uh, Joe Cocker, Donovan, Burt Bacharach is not in the Hall of Fame. He wrote more hits than Paul McCartney, you know. So there's a lot of people that I would like to champion and go, come on, you know, get these guys in the Hall of Fame before I go in again, you know. Um, yeah, but you brought in your old band members for and Welcome to My Nightmare again. And they were great. I mean, when, when we did the show at the night, at the, at the, uh, the, the thing, the uh, inauguration thing, you know, induction, the band played great. Dennis, Neil, and Mike, and then we had Steve Hunter play for Glenn. And the band sounded as tight as it had ever sounded. It was really tight. And so after that, I said, look, I'm doing Nightmare Part Two. I want you guys to write on it, and I want you guys to be on the album. And they said, okay. So Neil and Dennis and Mike and I each wrote a song together. And it ends up, those three songs are three of the best songs on the album. Uh, when Hell Comes Home, uh, Bite Your Face Off, and Runaway Train are the three songs that those guys, those guys worked on. And man, I couldn't ask for better. They were, they were great. Did they thank you for paying their bills the past 30 years or you know, so? I think we're way past that. We, we, you know, when you're best of friends, you don't even talk like that about it to each other. We're, you know, the, it was one of those things where when we broke up, we didn't break up with any bad blood. We never broke up. You know, you hear certain bands that just hate each other and they can't stand each other and they want to kill each other. The guys in our band were always great friends. I mean, uh, Even when I was gone for 30 years, we always called each other. They were always, I'd bring them on stage. If I was on there, I'd say, what are you doing? I've got a new band. You know, I'd say, well, we'll play it on my radio show. Let's play it. So we were always good friends. No lawsuits, no bad blood at all. Uh, and that's probably why that we don't really think in terms of, you know, they know that I'm out on tour and that sells back, you know, uh, but... 
Good. I'm glad. I'm, you know, I hope they all do really, really, really well. Hmm. I've got no problem with any of them at all. It's too bad about Glenn. Glenn was just, he was one of those guys that just, he was Holden Caulfield. You know, I mean, he was like a catcher in the rye. He was that kid that had to be a juvenile delinquent. Hmm. He just had to be the guy that was getting away with something. <laughs> He always had a weapon with him. He always had a drug with him, hidden on him. You know, even when he wasn't supposed to, no matter what it was, he was that juvenile delinquent. He was James Dean, you know. And it killed him. You know, we we all stopped what we were doing, and and you know, moderated at least. I stopped everything. The other guys just took it all down to nub. And Glenn just went full speed ahead, you know. And you couldn't stop him. He was he was. He burned himself out with alcohol and tobacco and whatever else he was doing. What was his path? It was the way he Maybe, was. Yeah. It was the way he was built. Yeah. He, I don't think there was such a thing as Glenn Buxton going to rehab. Yeah. Glenn Buxton was Keith Richards. Him and Keith would would have been would have been best friends. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Back in the bad old days, you know, <laughs> Keith now is totally straight. I mean, you know, Keith is he's like me. I mean, we're drinking Gatorade and stuff, you know. <laughs> Well, otherwise he would fall down a tree. <laughs> well, I mean, Keith Richards, for a while, was a modern-day medical miracle that anybody with that much toxic in his system could still be alive. You know, I kept saying, what a great movie it would be like if a vampire bit him and took his blood died. and just died immediately. <laughs> you know, the, guy, the vampire goes, oh, oh. <laughs> Not many people know that Alice Cooper's career started out with a chicken. Yes. <laughs> did, yes. Did, do you remember that Isn't story? Isn't it funny that the, the, the chicken that we didn't bring on stage, <laughs> that somebody threw on stage, and I didn't kill it. I put it in the audience, and the audience killed it. And I'm the great chicken killer. <laughs> Colonel Sanders has killed billions of chickens, and nobody mentions him, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh Yeah, it was. I think it was at that time when people wanted to believe everything they could about Alice Cooper. They wanted to believe that Alice took the chicken and ripped the throat out and drank the blood into it, you know. And I think if I was a 14-year-old kid, I would want to believe that too. Sure. So it was one of those things where Frank Zappa said, did, did you kill a chicken last night? And I went, no. And he says, well, don't tell anybody. They love it. Some people feared that this could be some kind of a farewell tour. But, but Mick Jagger is still around, so you have at least to go another six years, right? Yeah, he's going out on another tour, so that, that puts me in for five more years. Uh, you know, I, I always use that sort of as a good thing for me, is the fact that Jagger and the Stones are still out there, and they still sound great. They're just rock. They, they live for it. And when I started, and I saw Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones on Ed Sullivan's show, and I was 15, I went, Oh, I want to do that, you know, and, and and never thinking I'd even ever get to meet the Rolling Stones. Now they're old friends, you know, and now I kind of pattern myself as looking at this going, if Mick Jagger can do this when he's 67, so can I. So now it's it's kind of like I put myself in that position to to go on. Now, Chuck Berry's still doing it. He's 90, you know. Uh, these old rockers are going on forever. I mean, uh, Mick Jagger and I, we've got 20 more years to go before we match. At least. Yeah, Chuck Berry and uh, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis. Fats Domino's 92 and he's still playing. So we're, we're kids. We're just kids. <laughs> Mulatcha!